On today's episode of Chalk Talk, we are talking about the core. Uh, we've been kind of picking apart different topics along the way, so be sure to check out previous episodes where we've gone into things like cardio, detraining, all sorts of great topics with Coach Brez. Uh, go check those out and go check out all of our different content at platform.com. That's plt4m.com. We're going to go ahead and kick this one off. This is Chalk Talk presented by Platform. Let's go. All right, so we are going to start off talking about the core, um, and I actually wanted to talk about this topic because I see everyone kind of using the word core in a few different ways. Some people talk about it like, as we know it, oh, let's do core cash out, you know, just a bunch of different ab exercises, Mm -hmm. sit-up crunches, you know, Russian twists to kind of like finish out a workout. Other people will say like, you need a strong core to be able to resist or be able to, you know, do all of these different things. And they're talking about their abs. They're talking about their kind of like trunk in general, like the, you know, more than just the, the, the abdominals themselves, almost mm-hmm. like from like below your chest down to almost like your mid hip. You know, there's a lot of different ways that we throw around the word core. And I think I want some clarity in terms of what we're talking about. And I don't know if we're going to get it by the end of this episode, but maybe kind of try to figure out some of the things when we're talking about core, what it is, what it isn't, and if there is one true definition. So I threw this one to you, Brez. Where, where did you start and kind of where did you end up going? Yeah. Uh, well, I started with your your first question, which was, you know, what what is the true definition of your core? Because it does get thrown around in a lot of different ways, a lot of different people with certain connotations, uh, specific or otherwise. And so I, I, that's where I started. And uniquely enough, and I think this topic is is fun because they're really what I found is there's there's really no black and white answers to almost any of the questions. Obviously, we know certain things or or feel that we do, and there's a lot of theoretical application and understanding of core and core training. But for the most part, I mean, there's even there was one major study I looked at, which was just a study of how people perceive coaches and athletes, the core and the training thereof, and even there. Yeah, there is no there is no accepted definition of the core that everybody agrees on, even the quote unquote scientists versus the you know everyday you know users of training. Sure. Um, so I think it's it's useful to try to just create a a general understanding of what we mean when we say the core, with also the understanding that it's not necessarily a black and white answer. And a lot of people might use slightly different definitions and might include things that others do not. Um, For our purposes, you can think of the core very much as the midline um, or the trunk of the body, as you you mentioned, is maybe the most common term. Um, And I like to think of it as basically from your your rib cage through your pelvis front and back um, everything that's not your actual limbs so um, I look at the the mid and upper back through your glutes and then from the front basically your abs into your hip flexors some people include the shoulders some don't um, and I think it, it, it to some degree it doesn't really matter we're basically talking about everything that surrounds um, the spine, uh, which I would include the pelvis therein because it is, you know, the end point of the spine. So, um, there is far more to your core than abs, which I think a lot of people now, whereas maybe even five years ago would not have understood, um, the core is not just about your abs, which when we're talking your abs, we're talking, most people are talking about your, your, your rectus, um, set of abs, which is that, you know, six or eight or four pack or whatever people like to think of, but there's also the transverse abs, uh, your obliques, um, and then obviously the back, you have uh, your erectors, the multifidus, and um, then I would also include um, the hip, which would be your glutes for the most part. I like to think of the, the hip flexors also as a part. And then I would very much go into um, you know, the upper back, you know, scapular region, which is part shoulder, but also very much part trunk because it's kind of intertwined with the stuff that stabilizes the spine all the way up through even the neck. Um, so it sounds like 
to be honest, you know, when you say that, like it's almost your entire body, which is really important to understand because I think we get a little bit too narrow with our understanding of what the core is, even when we think not just abs. It, it, it's really like your global system that allows for movement, stability, um, all of those things. So I like to think of it as from shoulders to hips mm-hmm. and, you know, how specific you get there is not really important. So long as you understand all of the different systems at play um, and the different muscles that go into creating movement, creating stability, resisting movement, um, and all of those kind of unique training elements as it pertains to the core itself. Yeah, for sure. And that's a good kind of place to, to kick it because I think what you talked about is like there are some people in terms of like when you say core or we're going to now we get into the training aspect of it of like thinking like all right then I need to like work my abs and then we get into that rabbit hole sometimes and and I think that's the easiest way and it's like kind of the a way in which kids or, or athletes can kind of know all right like that's part of what we're working on mm-hmm. but at the same time like you know you know I, I mean at least if you've ever done like a tough you know set or anything of like a front squat or different movements like you're midline like we talked about or where you described is pretty lit up like you can feel it all the way through and like to me that's what I always thought of like wow this is a great like core development like your center of mass the way that it then translates like we often talk about on the field, like if you're trying to stay upright or be able to like Mm -hmm. that whole core, like you described is like everything other than your limbs that you're trying to basically like control. Yeah. And we'll get into, I think more specifics about the different elements of core training, uh, you know, in the gym, because you're right. There is a very unique kind of spectrum of core training, which in reality covers probably 80% of what you do in the gym because your body is not generally worked in isolation a lot in a good strength and conditioning program. And it's certainly not worked in isolation outside of your core. Um, Heavy weightlifting, um, that is a big component of core training. It's not the only piece, but it is a big piece, which is obviously also what you use for a lot of other things. So it is unique that there is a lot to core training. And then it is very, very worth mentioning. I've had to do, I had to do this in class when I had kids talking anatomy and physiology for the first time. I talked to my kids uh, from an athletic perspective still. There is still just a massive pervasive misunderstanding that your core is your abs and maybe even more uh, dangerously that the goal is to have a six pack. That means I have a strong core or that I need to do a lot of ab isolation movements to even reach that goal. Yeah. And I think a lot of people will just do more, more, more like ab exercises or exercises looking to target the abs and, you know, daily, you know, just doing them, doing them, doing them, thinking that the result is going to be, I'm going to look in the mirror one day and get a six pack where I think we could probably be able to describe a little bit and I'll let you kind of put your two cents in, in terms of like a lot of it has to do with a lot of other things, diet and all the other parts and also genetics and that maybe just because you don't have like the six pack that's shining in the mirror doesn't necessarily write you off as having a bad cork. Cause like you said, there's so many other elements to it. Yeah. So I, Two pieces to that to that question or, or statement, and I think it's very worth uh, mentioning, is that if you're talking about the visual aesthetic aspect of a quote-unquote nice core, which is really just the six-pack that everybody likes to, to say that uh, you know they're looking for or, or have or whatever the case may be, that visual aspect of you know core is one no ninety something percent determined by what you eat. You cannot, you can do a million ab exercises and never get a six pack as it pertains to the visual aesthetic look of say your stomach. And why is that? It's because everybody has ab muscles. What's on top of that is going to determine how they look. And you cannot do abs to spot reduce fat over your stomach. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as spot fat reduction. I think we all have a pretty good understanding of that, but it's important to note that if you want to lose fat to gain definition per se, you need to create a caloric deficit with what you eat and your activity. So uniquely enough, if you want a six pack, the best things to do are not ab exercises. You need to do global system movements, a compound heavy, 
high exertion exercises that create additional caloric expenditure, right? Like you're gonna get a better result in terms of that six pack look you're looking for if you do heavy squats and deadlifts than just a lot of ab exercises. Mm -hmm. Is ab exercising useless? No, and it, are the rectus unimportant? No, but one, like we said, it's only really gonna be determined by you know, the, your, your nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, genetics also does play a role because certain people have higher and lower kind of baseline levels of, uh, of fat uh, as well as where it's kept. Some people just keep it there. I could get down, I could get down to six or 7% body fat and most of it's gonna be kept right along my midline. I'm not gonna have a six pack ever. Um, I can get close, it ain't gonna happen for me. Others might never carry it there and they never have to do anything and they're always got a six pack. So I think it's important, we've said it in a lot, a lot of other places, forget what you look like if you're at all concerned with um, performance um, or even just lifelong fitness and health, it's not really gonna be about whether or not you can show that you have a six pack um, that determines whether or not you have a strong and stable and healthy and you know resistant of injury core. Um, but I think to your point, um, my second follow-up was doing ab isolation. When everybody says ab isolation, they're talking about the rectus abdominis, which is just those muscles in front. There's a lot more to it. So that is a piece, but you have to do a lot of other things that target the hips, the back, the low, the mid, the high back, the sides of your trunk. Um, so it's not just about those crunches that you can do. Can you do those exercises? Yes, we'll get into that as well. But there is a lot more to the core than abs, and there is a whole lot more to core function, health, and performance than seeing a six pack. Right. That cannot be understated. We that like that should really be thrown out the window, especially if you're thinking about it from a performance standpoint. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to kind of then start to talking about what we will get into in more detail of what it is intended for in athletic performance. Cause even that, I don't think everyone agrees on. Um, but I, I do hear that like part of, part of what I think everybody starts to talk about and it's starting to get warm out is like, Oh, it's beach season. It's this, it's that. And like, we're all, we're all, you know, generally aware of both students, athletes, even adults wanting to basically trim and find those different things. And I think, while we have never been in the camp of selling, beach bodies it's it's obviously like we've talked about in previous episodes just things that like you know if a, if a kid wants to do a little extra here a little extra there because they think it's fun or it's part of like it gets them excited to continue working out that's one thing but like you described what you talked about with your students what you still talk about your athletes is important to set the stage of expectations too because mm -hmm. i think there will be kids that will often be like all right i I get what you're saying. The core is your whole trunk, yada, yada, yada. I still want the six pack. And yeah. it's like, okay, we still hear that, but consider all the other factors. Well, not just that. If you want the six pack, fine, great, cool. But don't think that doing abs in the gym is going to get you there. Yeah. The abs are built in the kitchen. Sure. Right. So um, if you're, if that's a goal, that's totally fine. I mean, there's a lot of, there's nothing wrong with working out for the self-confidence or body image or whatever, you know, aesthetic goals that you have. That's totally cool. I think what we always try to do here is explain if, what, I don't care what your goal is, let's find the right answers to that goal. Yeah. Um, and I think understanding that it's, it's a lot of nutrition and then also understanding that, um, you know, even aesthetically or just general fitness and health, you're going to want to look more than just at those those things in front that are most visual. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great point um, to make about it's okay to do, it's okay to want, but understanding the, the, full the bigger picture. picture. Sure. All right. And with that, I think we'll transition into more so some of that performance related conversation when it comes to the core and talk about sort of something that I think it's super interesting because I can almost visualize what I think of when we put them into two camps, but I'm talking about the core used for stability versus the core used for movement. And I'll kind of set the stage in understanding that like you see a lot of times both in the gym or, you know, that we were doing them last week in terms of like the, like anti-resistance, anti-rotational anti holds. Yep. That's where I would say like, we're probably working on like stability. And then you'll see those same anti-rotational holds and people will start kind of like moving with them. And that will be the movement picture. Like, you know, going to try to like brace yourself if someone's trying to push you off the line or anything else like that, stability. Movement, I'm thinking like, all right, as you torque to take a shot, you torque to throw the ball, you, you're using your core to almost move. So 
Some people would say it's all this, some people say it's all that. Let's talk about both of those terms, how it relates to the core, and that's instability and movement. Yeah, I think it is important before we even talk about like what are the benefits of core training, as you said, like let's talk about what is the, the role of your core. Um, call it performance, or call it life. What, what, it, what is the reason that your core is important? What does it do every day? And this is where it gets weird because there is a really contentious and divisive belief on what the role of your core is amongst trainers, coaches, athletes, et cetera. Um, and I've been on kind of both sides of it. I think now I lie in the middle, but essentially you, you, you nailed it on the head with there are really two camps of people. And what I'll say before I even mention what the camps are, I, I should mention the belief in either one of these is entirely theoretical. We have no empirical proof that says either one of these things is the right answer. There is no like, oh, I can go look it up in a textbook. It's, all right, I understand anatomy, I understand performance, and I'm going to come up with my assumption on what the role of the core is. And it's really played out in two different answers. And the first one, I think that's the biggest kind of all the rage right now, as you mentioned, is that the belief that the core is solely meant to resist movement. Um, and what I mean by that is essentially everything that surrounds your spine is intended to keep your spine in a relatively neutral position. It's not a static position. There's you know movement that is allowed and healthy and everything else. But the belief is that I should never use the core to generate movement. I should always use it to either uh, resist it and or transfer it from one end of the body to the other. Um, and that's where you see a lot of coaches that say like, we never do sit-ups, we never do, um, you know, moving core work of any kind. All we do is anti-rotation, isometric, this, that, and the other, uh, because that's the way the core is intended to work. There's that group. Then there's the group that says, there is absolutely no reason that we should ever believe that your core musculature is not also intended for movement, which I think is a very fair statement. There is no muscle in the body that isn't intended to apply force, generate movement, or stabilize. Yeah, and I think like what's tough about the core is often because it's stabilizing and it's allowing other things as we know it to do a lot of the work, so to say. And it's all depending on what we talked about at the very beginning of like, where do you draw the lines in which like you say the course starts and ends, which is, as you said, still up for some sort of understanding. But like a great example is everybody knows, and I'll use it because people know it is like the core exercise flutter kicks. That's something that is in swimming, actually a big part of swimming. And while your legs are doing the movement, your, your core's your, not moving. Your, your core's not moving, but it is very much a driving force of that overall big package. You know what I mean? Well, like, yeah. So uh, that, that's where this is like, uh, neither one is wrong. And I think that's the important uh, point that I came to is, is there a very, very important uh, role of the core um, that is focused on maintaining complete control of your limbs by not allowing the core to move. Yes, flutter kicks, which you could say, hmm, pretty useful for things like swimming just because it's a very similar movement whether or not you agree with specificity of movement sure. and training or whatever. But what is actually happening? Your hip flexors, which do you call that the core or not is again, that's right. dependent that's, so on. So again, that's where you get into the. But, but I think it's important to note that like right there is a great example of your limbs are moving and it, it, the only way they're moving is with a complete stabilization of everything else, which is your core. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think very similarly, and this is why the reason that that's such a prevalent um, belief is that look at the things that we do kind of most specifically um, and s sexily in performance. Think uh, heavy weightlifting or sprinting or power work, most frequently that's requiring a transfer of power from maybe your legs 
hips, which again, if you call the hips the core, it kind of goes out the window, but it's basically saying, I'm going to take, you know, power from below and transfer it up into the arms, you know, pitching or whatever the case may be, or, or even the golf swing. Uniquely enough, there are people that say the golf swing, perfect example of how the core is supposed to resist movement because you're transferring it from one end to the other. You don't want it to, to move. You then there are other people going, I've watched a golf swing and that's not what I'm seeing. Um, but what I would also say is that's great. And, you know, lifting heavy so that you can generate power in your legs or running fast, um, you know, maintaining a very stable torso while, you know, the limbs are moving is very, very important. So training in that way is important. I would be very hard pressed to get about my day without generating movement through my core. Sit-ups are not impractical. And they're also not unhealthy. We can di dive into that at some point too. They're, for some reason, that's a thing, and I don't know why. And a lot of coaches would agree with me. A lot of chiropractors and other people agree with me. But anyway, we'll get to that. But I'm hard pressed to never generate movement with my core. Um, and you also can't say that the core doesn't, uh, you know, isn't responsible for generating movement if you believe in things like the hinge, right? Or um, getting up off the ground, even like Turkish get-ups has a lot of core stability, but it also requires the generation of force, you know, from the core musculature itself. And if you believe in anti-rotation, but you are doing it for rotational movements, that seems odd because rotational movement is going to be all of the transverse and your rectus and, and low back, because those are going to be isolated in some sort of isometric movement while the others are moving or vice versa. I think both have a very real role to play in saying that, you know, I should never generate movement about my core is probably just as bad as saying I should never do, you know, submaximal intensity. I should only ever do maximal intensity. I don't think there exists a world in which we can isolate body parts or areas and say the only function that exists is this, even though it absolutely does not apply in that I can generate force yep. with my, I can generate high force. I can generate low force. I can generate it for low load or volume and I can generate it for high volume. So if it's possible, it obviously exists somewhere and we probably shouldn't just completely avoid movement. I think that's one of the biggest things I see for people that are against those that say that the core is not supposed to move. Avoiding movement is one of the best ways to set yourself up for injury because you were unprepared yeah. and saying that, well, it's only, only supposed to stay stable is uh, maybe a bit, you know, missing the point. Um, and I, I like the, you know, kind of confluence of the two ideas where it's both are important. And if you believe that the bigger importance is, you know, resisting movement, maybe that's your focus, but never doing anything that requires core movement, never doing a sit up because you think it's unsafe or because that's not how your body's supposed to move is very weird to me because that's how I get out of bed every morning. Right. And well, I'm not saying that I need to do sit ups to get out of bed, but if just the first thing I do every morning requires it, I'm going to guess that it's existing in a lot of other places. And if you watch sport, same thing. Yeah. And I think that's a good kind of segue because like even just sitting up straight, right. Or even just thinking about well, like, yeah all of the different things that start to like kind of layer into what we're talking about in terms of the core is like the benefits of being able to know that like, Hey, like I am not, again, if I'm avoiding it or anything else like that, like, all right, do I have the ability to like maintain a solid posture? And I'm talking about just sitting and that's to your point. Now let's take it into, can you maintain a good posture when you are like in any sort of athletic and I don't, I'm not going to draw them all out because I think we can all think about those di different types of things. It's like that's it. It's in, at least the way I'm thinking about it. It's most basic form, right? Like, no, can it's, a, you it's a great point. And I think what, and I want to, I want to hit this because I think most people that maybe somebody's listening to this and saying, I'm in the camp of, I don't believe that, you know, the core should ever create movement. And what you said is, you know, maintaining proper posture while other things are moving or just maintaining it while you're sitting. And they say, well, th there's your point. Like, it shouldn't move, like it shouldn't slouch. It should, so we want to train it, you know, to be completely stable. There is a very real consideration for if you do isolation strength and strength endurance movement about core musculature, 
your ability to apply stability for long periods of time is improved. Yeah. Just doing isometric holds isn't going to turn you into a posture machine. Right. You have to do other things too. And if you want to see the best results, you're going to want to train multiple different things. Again, we'll, we'll probably hit that later, but I wanted to say that because that it's a great point you made that there is a lot more to core function than movement or not movement. It's global systems, it's global movement, it's global immovement. Mm -hmm. That's not a word. Immobil uh, the lack of movement, I think both are important. And to get both, you have to do both. Yeah. Um, and that's that's important. Well, because I do think then the next place we can almost layer onto that, as I was just saying it and thinking about it, is like I remember you know talking about um, – Starting and stopping, accelerating, decelerating, like being able to keep yourself upright and mm -hmm. not like completely collapse over as you're right. bringing yourself to that slowing stop. Like I think that is you have to brace your entire body. You have to be able to maintain a strong midline and a strong core as you come to like a screeching halt if you're sprinting, change of direction, anything like that as well. Like it, it is in a lot of places when you start to draw the full picture of what I think exists more there than even I would have started at the beginning of this podcast to be able to say like, yeah, I get it. But like, all right, now just, we're exaggerating. Just think like how, how much stronger do you think you could brace that breath before a heavy squat, that tight controlled midline when you're, you're sprinting? How stronger do you, how much stronger do you think that would be if you did both isometric holds and anti-movement as well as maybe some high volume sit-ups at time maybe some um you know power movement with light load uh like med ball slams if you can generate a lot of force you're gonna be able to brace stronger yeah. so it, i think it's got to have both but it is important because i think what's worth noting is the, the the benefits of core training in total as you just said like what are all the different things that it can apply to um and generally speaking you know Physiologically, core strength and stability training is believed to lead to greater maximal power and, a, and basically more efficient use of the muscles in your arms and legs, which is basically everyday movement as well as performance on the field, right? So theoretically, you are reducing the risk of injury because you are stabilizing a system that is required to operate at high intensity, right? So you don't fall out of those good positions or you don't find yourself in a disadvantageous position without realizing it. Um, and then as you said, I think really important is everyday posture, uh, you know, just the the hunched over, you, you know, the sitting is the new smoking uh, concept that everybody is now pretty aware of. All of those things are going to be benefited in your daily life by pretty consistent core training. Um, and you don't want to ever have a weak link, right? I think that's the easiest way. Well, if, you're, if your legs and arms are super strong, well, one, you can only get them super strong if your core is strong to get you there, right? Like you can't lift heavy squats yep. if you don't have a strong, um, stable midline. Uh, again, you're working them at the same time at times, but you want to do some targeted work as well. Um, and I think also worth noting is it, there's no, it's not wrong that for a large population in this country or across the world, low back pain is like a big common feature. And, and for myself as well. And uniquely enough, the only thing that seems to be kind of a universal fix or at least a universal kind of amelioration of low back pain is targeted specific core strengthening. And I notice like if I'm lifting heavy, if I'm really, really engaging my, the, the anterior core, like even just the rectus and uh, transverse abs, my squat doesn't, I don't find that discomfort in low back pain. So there's a reason that it exists in rehab and everything else. So there's obviously a very big role to play there. Now, as we just said, there's a lot of benefits to core training. The unique thing is, as I found, I, I guess I knew this, but I didn't know this, know this is it's entirely theoretical. We have no empirical evidence that says that core training does anything of value. So I think it is important to note that, I, yes, core training is important. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, but we don't have a whole lot of evidence to say that it does 
X for performance. It does X for injury prevention. We have no proof of that. We mm -hmm. don't even have any suggested proof of that. We just have what basically everybody else has used for you know centuries is the eye test. Stronger core generally you know leads to less injuries. Yep. Um, if you have a strong core, theoretically, you should be able to generate power in your limbs more, which means you're going to be able to play better, run better, jump better, you know, whatever the case may be. So I think it's important to note that we don't really have any proof. And the reason I say that is, so then I don't think we can, any one of us, stick ourselves in a, in a world where we say that this is the only way we should train the, the core. strong camp. Yeah. Because I, I just, you know, I, I find it really hard to, uh, agree with anybody that says that I know that this is the way that it's supposed to work without any proof. Um, well, I think and, like even the, even the squat example, like you're talking about, or, you know, all of those different types of things just make some inherent sense. Like as you start to apply them in your daily life, like, no, I don't think that like, as I started to see like my, and I know we've already debunked that it's not just your abs, but as I started to feel like, all right, I've been doing a lot more core development throughout my entire body that my squat inherently got better because I could brace better. I could have that like stable midline. I oh, felt yeah. good. Like, and at times when I would just kind of like basically be walking back into the weight room, expecting to do something or be able to perform the movement, I could feel that my midline and my trunk and my core were the first to go, right? Like I was talking to a friend the other day, we were talking about deadlifting and how people like doing, it's the king of all core lifts, right? The, the, uh, hook grips and the reverse grips and you know, all the different things to be able. And he's like, that's, that is the least of my worries. Cause the first thing to go every single time is my core and my mm -hmm. midline. And I know that like, that's the part you can of feel it. it. That's the part where I need to develop even more. It's not about what grip I'm doing. My grip never fails me. It's something else every single time. Yeah. And I think that goes to highlight the parts where it's like, no, it might not. You might not say like, if you do X, Y, and Z in the weight room, your deadlift will get better and your squat will get better. And this will get better because you focused on this in your core. But it's like, again, like we always go back to sort of like the driving force of bringing it all up together is going to help. Not to mention a lot of those movements in and of themselves are core exercises and core development. Absolutely. It's not like you have to do one and the other. You can yeah. look at them in that like kind of plane in a whole thing, which I think is a really great segue into uh, where I myself now after this kind of good um, journey of the core and talking about it is say, all right, well then like, how do we think about training it? Mm -hmm. Do we think about training it in those like kind of big barbell movements, like power lifts, Olympic lifts and all the things that come with them? Do we think about us? It, it's on a separate part of a workout as we've talked about, or is it kind of a mix of both? Like, is it just kind of what makes the most sense? And like you talked about that kind of like full kind of compound effect. And, and the answer is that that second piece where it's really about the full big picture. It's really kind of spread throughout all of training. Um, and I think that's why we get people that want to go one camp or another, because it says this is our core training and this is how I do it. It makes it a lot easier if you don't think about kind of a myriad of different approaches because you can say, this is all we do. And that makes it easier. And I get that. But I think core training like cardio, like strength, like hypertrophy, like mobility, like just performance development in general, cannot ever be put into nice, tight, easy packages that says, I checked this box. I'm done. I don't have yeah, to do anything yeah. else. And I like that the research I did do really kind of cemented this idea of the core is like anything else and that there is a spectrum of training approaches that all have validity and all have a role to play in a larger developmental program, whether that be just about the core or the core as it pertains to the rest of your training. Because uniquely enough, um, and, and this is really important to note, I think, is that they have, again, proven never a word we can use in science, let alone exercise science, but they have shown that the core, again, the core is a lot of pieces. So to believe that a lot of pieces only work in one consistent way would be weird, but we've shown that the core, even as a total system, works both in three very different ways and can only be trained for those three ways in different ways. Yeah, so, so, so before you get into that, because I think I know where you're going, 
what we've done in previous episodes, which I've liked, is we've kind of said like cardi or you know detraining or this or that. We've kind of broken up the broken up those things because I think we often try to put it in those simple buckets. Mm-hmm. And we've said like strength, power, hypertrophy, co- like stability, yep. mobilization. I think for these. Uh, and I'll let you kind of define them at the forefront. I think it's probably good to just talk about those in like the similar buckets, but how it relates to that. Cause I think that has been really nice for people to, to listen to and say like, okay, like now I can kind of see them in those planes. Of course there's going to be overlap. Of course there's going to be different parts, Thousands. but like, but like you said, there's going to be, there's going to be core in terms of like, like, well, I'll let you define them and then we'll go. Cause sure. I, I don't want to, I don't want to bury the lead. So uh, for the purposes of the dis- purposes of this discussion, you can think of it, as the core um, can be trained for and exert strength. It can express endurance and be trained thusly. And the all sexy word of it can display stability and be uh, trained for such. Um, And and, before you go, because I think that's an important part is the endurance part is I think probably the one that I didn't consider before going into this because we often like, you know, we'll talk a lot about like, you know, and you'll get into it for the power of like being able to do one movement one time, like a golf swing or this or that. But the endurance aspect of it, I think is really interesting because there are so many sports in which like we always talk about like along the way, if your core starts to break down, your trunk starts to break down, everything starts to collapse. And I don't think I really considered it in that way a lot. So I think to set the framework, I think if you want to talk about strength, and then endurance and how they kind of almost work hand in hand, I would be most interested in because I think that's the part I didn't consider before this. Yeah. Um, and I think I'd even add a fourth that we can talk next is there is an element of power as well, yeah. which we will talk about. Um, but so, yeah, if you want to start with strength, um, this is something that the core can produce force, right? Your low back your mid back, your abs, your transverse abs, um, they can all exert force and you can increase strength so that they can exert more force at any given moment. You can do things like weighted sit-ups, right? Like you could do basic sit-ups until you have a competency there. You can load sit-ups up. Your abs will get stronger, right? And that's okay. That's not only okay, but it can serve, um, you know, significant purposes and you, you can actually gain strength. They've, they've shown that you can get to a point where you're actually gaining strength just like you would with like a back squat. Um, then there is the core endurance piece, which as you said, is extremely important because your ability to resist fatigue is one of the greatest indicators of a lower uh, potential for injury. And if your core is such an important piece, knowing that the ability uh, for you to resist fatigue in specific areas of your core is extremely important. So light light load, high volume work is just as useful with dynamic core movement as well as static core movement because your ability to resist fatigue. Yeah. In one swing, are you going to get fatigued? No. No, but maybe global fatigue over the course of uh, you know, an entire 18 holes walking golf might, you know, in some way, shape or form tax the core. And if you haven't built up a resistance to that, the next time it goes to resist movement or create movement, it might not be able to. Yep. Um, and so there's obviously an important point there. And also when you work to fatigue with any sort of volume, that also has been shown to increase strength. Right, you can actually get to the point where if you've done high number of sit-ups at the end, they're very difficult, right? And they require a lot of concentrated effort. You are generating, you know, strength adaptation in your core. And this is sit-ups. This is good mornings. This is back extensions. Um, they're all, you know, important pieces. And then, so you can think of that as like, okay, anything with sets and reps is strength or endurance to some degree. Um, and then anything that's timed, held, or uh, otherwise kind of slow, I guess, is more going to be in the realm of stability. So like a plank hold is going to work core stability, gotcha. which is obvious, right? Like it, it's not moving. You, you don't want it to move. Anti-movement is stability. Yep. Um, and it is important. But uniquely enough, it, stability development is highly, highly uh, neuromuscular. 
it's about coordination and proprioception. It's about learning how to turn on all of the muscles and coordinate them at the same time than it is developing their ability to do so, uh, aka that strength and endurance. So stability, like one, you don't want to have a weak core, but to generate actual stability, it's not about loading up heavy planks. It's about doing that in a very kind of internalized way where you are learning how to find the right position and maintain it. Yeah. And that's more of a brain muscle connection than it is exertion. So you don't necessarily need to go hold four minute planks. You might never do a plank over a minute, minute and a half um, because you do want to challenge yourself at times because the only times you're going to be really dialed into your, your positioning and, uh, you know, activation of everything is going to be when you're, you know, tired and that's when you got to challenge yourself. But it, it's going to be more about learning how to control. So things like dead bugs, the slow kind of global connection of all of the musculature that's requiring of really, really precise movement is going to be more about the brain muscle connection than it is tiring out the muscles. For sure. Okay. And and I think you, you mentioned those three. You kind of made a small poke at power. Um, I'll let you kind of talk about that one before we wrap up because I think that is something that I I always found interesting because like – you picture now again it's depending on how you're doing it but like i always pictured like you know you see someone snapping the the med ball like kind of throw um now obviously if you're just doing them over and over again it might bleed into endurance or anything else well, like that, and that, but that's yeah. where we get into the trouble but so yeah i think power is very much relevant as well um you know people would make the argument that you know anything rotation or even um, you know med ball slam or a rotational throw. Some people would say, well, it's actually just your hips. You're going into internal rotation of the hip, and that's what's generating movement, and the core needs to stay stable. Others saying, I actually see quite a bit of movement there, and we need to generate force as well. Um, so I. I don't think either is wrong. I don't think having an opinion is even worth it because you're going to do those movements. Um, and the intention is to be able to either ma just maximizing the force that you can create with your midline or transfer with your midline. How you determine the, the language there is probably unimportant, but things like med ball slams, med ball throws, um, even you know, jumps, et cetera, is going to, you're going to see spinal and midline movement. Um, it might be about maintaining stable posture so that the things that are driving the movement can do more work, more efficient work or whatever. Uh, but it is important to note that power is obviously part of our training as well. So, um, you know, the core is obviously an integral part of power, you know, however you want to state it. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's actually probably a good kind of roadmap that we've created in terms of understanding both what it is, what it's good for, maybe what we aren't sure it's necessarily good for, and uh, starting to understand like the different layers of, of core itself. Anything else you want to add to the conversation or we haven't touched on just yet um, in terms of understanding it before we wrap up? I mean, I think uh, really I was probably going to go shockingly where generally you go is like, you know, circle it for me. Like, what does it look like? Where do you put it and why? Um, I don't know if that's something worthwhile. It might be a lot to unpack, but we can try. Yeah. Well, I think probably at like the most like basic sense of, you know, I, I'm surprised now you're even jumping into let, let's circle it. <laughs> um, let's talk, let's talk about that. All right. So then with that, let's do like the circle. Cause I think you kind of talked about some of the different layers when it came to like strength sit-ups, weighted sit-ups. You talked about stability, which is like plank holds and other things. Endurance will start kind of, you blended some of those in there as well. Circle a few of them, think, talk about what we're thinking about, and then we can we can go to wrap up after that. Absolutely. So I think, you know, generally speaking, um, if you want to, you know, tick off the, the stability side of things, um, you can very much look at maybe more towards the beginning of a workout. Anytime you're going to use like global activation, like a dead bug, um, even, you know, planks or, or other isometric movements that are done with no load, but it's going to be more focused on the proprioception and control of the midline. Um, that's going to be something that is going to over time allow for, you know, better control, better CNS control, increased, um, you know, basically use of you know neurons motor neurons and all of the things that are going to make a stable midline possible um, so i like to look at that at the beginning when we do activation work and i think that's easy for a lot of people to understand it's what most people do is the beginning of workouts is just turning things on and that's not just about turning things on for the workout ahead but also for you know just basic understanding of how to do so anytime so that when you're on the field of competition it knows how to work in um you know synchronization with you know 
all of the different um, you know areas at play. But then also, I think you know strength, strength, endurance, and power are also important. So um, you know at times you're going to do things like uh, dynamic isolation movements, like sit ups, and that's okay. Um, even Russian twists, okay. Um, and you can do that at you know, either volume or load, um, you're going to generally create strength or hypertrophy, which will then support the strength and or the stability of the spine, etc. So, you know, you can do things like uh, at the end of workouts, there are, you know, times and reasons to do quote unquote core cash outs or add, you know, some high volume sit ups into a workout that might be just uh, an ability to keep up the aerobic element of your your finisher or your training for that day, you know, body weight circuits that a lot of people love. But at the same time, you're building up volume, which is going to build hypertrophy, which is going to stabilize the midline more over time and give you more of an ability to do so. And then obviously we talk power, anything, anytime you're doing power work, if you are concentrated on making sure that you are in proper position, then you are working your core during power. Whether or not you think it's generating or stabilizing it, either one, you're, you're getting the same result. Um, and then I think just as important to note is anytime you're doing something heavy, something compound, farmer's carries, overhead squatting, front squatting, it is all going to also work a blend of all of those things in that you are going to challenge the midline from a proprioceptive standpoint Right, so the people that say it just got to resist movement, and I just need to learn how to do it. Yeah, that's important, right? Because if you don't know how to brace yourself for a heavy squat, front squat, you're going to collapse. If you don't also have the requisite strength and strength endurance in a set of ten, eight, six, five, four at high load, you're also going to fail. So um, you know it's going to serve both purposes there, as well as those two isolation elements of coordination and um, you know strength and strength endurance are going to build towards things that are maybe more applicable to on the field performance, like being able to execute you know maximal efficiency in running economy during speed, and or you know heavy clean or any of those things. It's all work in the core and the things you do individually before and after workouts, in the middle of workouts. There's also, you know, instability. People like to jump on boju balls and other things like that. You don't necessarily need to do that. You know, forward and lateral goblet, uh, split squats, lunges, whatever the case may be, are also going to very much challenge the core, both from strength, strength endurance, and proprioceptive standpoint. So it almost exists without trying. But if you want to look at it very, very specific, I'd say, okay, well, just as long as you understand that things like heavy weighted movements, movements done moderately for high, high volume, anything, you know, what you would consider traditional strength or hypertrophy work is also going to very much work the core if you're picking the right movements, which I think at this point, everybody generally does, you know, bicep curls aren't going to do it, but a heavy, you know, goblet squat will, or a heavy goblet lunge or whatever the case may be. And then if you want to quote unquote circle it for people that are looking for like, this is the only reason I'm doing it. And this is what it's working is at the beginning, really targeted um, activation, coordination work, planks, um, you know, dead bug type items where it's like a plank plus movement. And then at the end, I very much am still a fan of, you know, low load, higher volume work so that you can build up strength and strength endurance. If you're really great, you know, hanging knee raises, strict knee raises that are going to challenge it with, you know, more intensity, aka each rep is harder, going to build strength, a weighted sit up. We don't necessarily program them internally here, but you can do that. And that's certainly valuable. So it's kind of like in the same framework, just like we talk about most things is we're looking to kind of like do the warm up where you can do activation or stability and then working towards what, what we often find in the, in the order of operation just for efficiency sake and also just kind of thinking about what you can get the most out of the different parts, strength, some sort of strength and working the abs and, and, and core in that way and then an endurance piece to kind of wrap up if it makes the most sense how we follow it and a decent amount of things. But totally. like you said, circling it is part where you can get those different aspects throughout. Um, now, I think – where I will kind of push us to end because we have gone a little bit longer than we typically do, oh, wow. and I will let you, I will let you finish here. Is kind of talk to me about how much like we try to make sure that we vary the different types of movements or different types of you know press days pull, you know, you know what I mean, like the different 
blocks of different types of training so we're not doing something over and over again. I mentioned at the very beginning of the episode where some people will just constantly do what they believe to be core and abs and crunches and everything right. else day after day after day. Is there a diminishing return? Is there a way in which you're now doing too much and in, in thinking about like I'm always – or is it is core a little bit different in that it's – not like the primary group or the primary thing that's happening. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Absolutely. Like- and the answer is yes and no. And it, it depends on, you know, what you're thinking about when you're thinking core, because we talked about the core is a really large system versus a small, you know, piece. And so should you do sit-ups every single day? No, I, I wouldn't squat you know, air squat or weighted squat at seven days a week, yeah. um, 52 weeks a year, nor would I do sit-ups every single day. Can I do the core every day? Sure. I, I'd call that kind of, you know, one of the elements that exists in every day, every program, but it's going to be t- dependent on your ability to balance that programming out over the course of weeks and months so that, you know, some days it might be um, higher volume interior core work. Some days it might be higher volume uh, posterior chain and core development, like yep. um, you know the erectors via good mornings or the hips. Um, and then other days, maybe I'm not doing any dynamic core work at all. I'm working, you know, the control or isometric. Or some days there really is no challenging core at any point, but I'm using it in my activation. So core can happen on every single day, but it's again, always about balancing your, your approach to training and the recovery therein. Don't just go high volume, anything every single day, but don't feel like you can't say that I'm doing core today because there's so much that goes on into the core. You could also, if you're the person that says, well, my, you know, scapular, um, you know, prehab and shoulder work is also my core, then, I mean, it could exist every single day. So it's entirely dependent on your own terminology. It was just think about what is the point. I want to improve over time core strength. I want to improve over time core endurance. I want to improve over time core stability so that all of those things are beneficial both in the weight room and on the field. How am I going to hit all of the different elements over the course of a week, a month, et cetera? Gotcha. Now I'm going to ask again, because I think we covered it. How'd we do? Oh yeah, I, th- I think we got it. I don't know how clear and concise I was, but um, I think we've hit everything. I, that's the tough part about this: is there's no definition of core. There's no definition of you know what is the point of the core. Yep. Nobody can agree on what the real reason is. I'd argue that just like everything else, um, you know, the core is really it doesn't really matter what your definition is, so long as you understand the the general uh, possible functions of it and how are you going to attack that over the course of a larger training plan rather than then today I'm doing core, yep. which is how we approach everything here. And I think that's what the, the, you know, the most efficient use of, you know, an athlete's time or your programming time or anything else might be. So it's really just about having a plan, knowing your goals, balancing them appropriately. Awesome. And that is where we will stop today. <laughs> um, now, I think like we talked about is all the, the summaries right there are, are very solid in thinking about how we want to approach the core. And even if your definition might not perfectly line up with what we've kind of navigated throughout and you have a different way of putting it in your own training plans or how you speak it to your kids, it's that understanding of like the bigger picture and how we kind of wrap it up on both like a day to day. Like we're not just doing core when we do sit ups and also like a week to week to week. Like here's the overall goal of developing as you, I think said a really nice kind of like the overall like system Mm -hmm. itself and not just like one little piece or or part of it. There's no miracle movement. There's no miracle approach. It's just about making sure that you hit the things that are important for fitness and development over time. However it is that you find the most effective. For sure. Awesome. A great place to stop. Thanks again for everybody for tuning in, listening, checking it out. As always, an invitation. If you have questions, you want to join the conversation or just want to pick the next topic for us, we're always looking for, you know, the next uh, conversation. You know, the core is just one thing that we were able to take a deep dive into this week. We can go in any direction that you guys might be interested listening and, and checking this out. So thanks again. And remember at Platform, it's always in pursuit of better.